been talking about quite a lot of it in the last two sessions in any case, so uh, I had to speak in 45 minutes, I'll try and make it half an hour instead. And, uh, it's obviously a question for discussion rather than a kind of presentation. Well, well, what we've seen so far is the development, I would say, of four points of view, possibly four forces on the crisis itself, within and outside, and in relation to the crisis. You, you've had, basically, uh, the governments putting forward a particular policy which they've carried out to the degree that they've carried anything out, and you had uh, an opposition which, unlike in previous times, is, is actually, at least is what they say, quite different. You, you also have, obviously, in addition to that, you have a liberal critique of the government uh, policy, and you have a working class attitude, or a critique of it. So what we've witnessed is a semi-Keynesian approach to it by pumping in large quantities of money. And under pressure, taking over a, a series of firms, obviously banks, but it's been more than banks, as we know. Uh, and the pressure to actually nationalize is actually continuing. That's on the one side. On the other side, you've had the Republican Party and the Conservatives here objecting to what the government is doing, which, which really is quite amazing. You've also had an, an attitude, particularly in the United States, that the government ought not to have, the Bush government then, now the Obama government, ought not to have saved the banks. Uh, and you can just begin with that. <clears throat> it's the usual left uh, nonsense, if one might say that. How on earth could you have not saved the banks? You could have put forward a demand for socialism. No banks, socialism. Fine. <clears throat> Uh, that, that, that's a demand. If you're not going to put, uh, put it forward, <clears throat> well, what are you going to do? Accept no banks, no money, no activity, not full employment, but full scale unemployment. That was the alternative. There was a real possibility of meltdown and chaos. So, what are you, <laughs> where do you stand? You stand for socialism and changing the society. But what you couldn't do was stand and say, don't bail out the banks. You could have kept quiet, <clears throat> but stand up and say, don't bail out the banks, and then effectively have a front in the United States with the right wing of re Republicans makes makes no sense at all to me. But that's what I, that's what actually happened. And there still is that um, uh, kind of viewpoint existing there. And, I mean, it's very hard to call it the genuine left different viewpoint, but it's certainly held amongst uh, sections of the left, unfortunately. And as we know, the left in, in America is distinguished by its idiocy, by and large. I can't say, can't say very much else about it. <coughs> Where the dominant left groups are Maoist or, or Stalinist, I mean, directly Stalinist. So, <coughs> It's kind of possibly what one might have expected. So, <clears throat> the idea, therefore, that uh, the monetary system ought not to be saved or, or uh, ought not have gone, uh, the government ought not have gone as far as it did and so forth, simply linked up with the right. What was interesting was that the right did take that viewpoint. Obviously, Bush couldn't and didn't. But there was a uh, criticism to his right once, which then became um, the official Republican policy, which is very much there today, uh, that very little ought to be done. The, the market is efficient. It will find its natural level, as it were. And if uh, banks go under, that's what they ought to do. They, they'll then be replaced by more efficient banks. <laughs> The fact that you get large-scale unemployment is a positive thing too. It will discipline the working class. So <clears throat> one could go along with that. I mean, I could go along explaining detailing this, but the, 
there, there, is, there is no need to. It's quite obvious where they, they, they stand. What, what was peculiar was that they were actually prepared to say, and are prepared to say, that uh, very little ought to be done and there ought to be, in effect, mass unemployment. I don't think there's any doubt there is, there is a definite shift to the right in the, uh, in the, in the spectrum, that's to say, the right has moved to the right. I'll come back to that. The, the government policy, uh, for categorizing, characterizes as a policy of muddling through. That's true both in America and here. In neither case have they put in sufficient money to basically um, save the economy, develop the economy, pull, pull out of the downturn, or what, uh, whatever terms you want for it. They simply haven't done enough of it. Now that's been detailed to a considerable degree by uh, liberal economists like Krugman um, and other Nobel Prize winners like Stiglitz. They made it quite clear that the attempt to save the economy or bring the economy out by the Obama administration was really only following on from what had already been done. What simply wasn't enough. Well, it's actually obvious if you look at the amounts, although they look fantastic, they, they just won't be enough to actually do the deed, and they aren't doing the deed. The, Obama has talked about uh, large-scale infrastructure developments. Now, obviously, that would have an impact. However, an interesting comment on it is in the um, latest Scientific American, where they aren't commenting on the politics of it, they simply point out without in any way criticizing it, that the proposal that they improve the public transport system by having uh, trains which don't go 30 miles an hour isn't up to much because now they're going to go, when they eventually get around to doing it, which they are doing, uh, well, they'll then go 80 miles an hour. So you, you can only say you know, it's, that it's simply amazing, the idea that they can they have back with it technology due to, to be replaced by more backward technology. But that seems to be the policy. They're simply not prepared to put enough money to put down the tracks to have uh, the kind of rapid trains that you have in Europe, but you don't have in Britain, of course. <clears throat> and of course, now, of course, in Britain, they're talking about it course, in 20 years' time, which really is irrelevant. <clears throat> but the point is that the um, grand schemes of uh, having large-scale infrastructure developments, something like the Great Depression, or going beyond that, don't amount to very much. The um, defense of it has been that it takes time to actually get the thing going well, <clears throat> which seems to mean that you have to have more people drawing up plans to draw up plans and so on, so that you eventually get around to it in, in a year's time or two years' time. Well, that seemed to be the overall proposal. So uh, it, does, it doesn't look <clears throat> as if it's an ideal way of getting out, the, getting out of the present downturn. As, as I argued yesterday, there clearly will be an upturn, although at the moment, in spite of the, term, uh, the, the green shoots, they aren't actually getting out of it, even if they've passed the inflection point. And it isn't declining as fast as it was. So the, the point here is that the proposals and the, the actual the action of, of um, the American government and the British government simply isn't enough. And they're well aware of it. They don't want to put any more in. It's not just a question of uh, uh, not understanding or whatever. They, they're just not prepared to go any further. Which again reflects the fear they have of full employment, even if, as Tina points out, in Germany, uh, the self Democrats are calling for full employment, which is truly surprising. So, the third viewpoint which I've mentioned, that of the Nobel Prize winner, well, it's really those of liberals, is much more the classical Keynesian viewpoint of making genuine concessions 
hand going towards full employment, but they're not being listened to, which isn't particularly surprising, unless it's, they don't appear to be listened to. Well, <clears throat> having mentioned uh, what amounts to crazies on the left, there, there is, on the other hand, obviously a, 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 a viewpoint which, to a degree, is being put forward. Like, I gather the car workers in um, the car workers in um, Detroit have put forward a plan for transport, not just for producing more uh, polluting cars, as it were, but an overall plan for um, transport in the United States, which makes some sense. Um, one could obviously <clears throat> put forward a series of demands which have been in, in terms of mortgages. Why do you bail out the banks? And the obvious thing to do is to bail out the, the working class who couldn't afford to pay the banks. Just give them their houses, give them the money to pay them. That would make far more sense for the point of the working class. And obviously it ought to be the uh, demands. To a very limited extent, the bills passed in the United States uh, have given some concessions <coughs> along that way. Uh, uh, along that way, in Britain, as far as I know, there, there's almost no concessions, which is interesting itself. And in Britain, the concessions that have been made, like leaving other banks not to evict people, aren't very much because, of course, the, the banks are quite happy not to evict people because they've discovered if they do evict them, the uh, the value of the property goes down, and the property, in fact, it even can cease to exist. It just decays. <coughs> the, the, the tiles go to the roof, water comes in, the whole thing can really <coughs> become an enormous loss for the bank. So it makes more sense to leave people in anyway. So they fairly happy to concede to the government at some level. So, in other words, the if one talks of class struggle in this regard, it's been very, very little, very poor. And, and uh, the left is very weak in Britain anyway, so you don't expect very much from it. But the trade union movement hasn't done very much at all. It's fairly obvious that it could have been a campaign demanding that workers who can't afford to pay have their payments made, perhaps given their houses and the banks paid that way rather than just being given a, a huge sum of money. Obviously the government's not, not prepared to do it, but the trade unions haven't demanded that either. So one has to say that the, um, the actual state of, the, uh, of any kind of fight in any kind of class struggle here is extremely limited. The question is how far that can go on. Well, obviously it can't. And one would ex expect over time as people are being dismissed an increasing degree of uh, fight back. And I have to say, uh, in in relation to the uh, the oil refinery and so forth uh, protests over the import of so-called foreign workers, uh, I, I find it very hard to support those workers, and particularly given the nature of South Africa. <coughs> the dis dis discrimination of, uh, in whatever form and however limited and however much it was qualified is simply not n not acceptable. It's very easy for the left to fall into that kind of trap because it's there clearly was a protest, it clearly is part of a class struggle, but it's simply falling into that trap is extremely dangerous, it seems to me. You only have to look at the history of South Africa to realize because it didn't, in South Africa, racial discrimination didn't come out of nowhere. And it wasn't that Afrikaners were inherently racist either. <clears throat> so the, the, the form at the moment doesn't seem to me to be a uh, salutary form for one one that one could do anything but criticize it. I don't know anything in continue like this because it's quite odd. Uh, I'm not referring to the workers who have, uh, in my view, embraced um, the racist demand. The, the, uh, so they continue like this simply because the level of unemployment is rising quite fast. And in Britain, the level of unemployment is very high, in fact. The, I think one would have to reckon the level of unemployment here is somewhere close to 20% now. I think the official level is about 7%. Because before, before the downturn began, there were 5 million unemployed, 3 million on disability benefit and capacity benefit. And, uh, 
roughly two million people who were genuinely unemployed as it were. And if they had no two, two, two to three million, so you, you, can, you can get up to something <clears throat> pretty close to 20 percent when you start to add people who aren't uh, actually registered at all. So <clears throat> it's, it is very high in Britain, but it's most obviously seen in the north rather than in the south, which has always been the case. Again, there, there doesn't seem to be any unemployment, un, any, any unemployed movement or, or anything like the, there has been in the past. So it's extremely limited at the moment, it does seem to be. I don't expect that would go on even if the left didn't do anything. I'm sure at some point the, there'll be some organization, a fight back will actually begin. But to the extent that there isn't one, the, the right has been emboldened, it seems to me. So if you go back to looking at the policy of the Conservative Party and the, uh, the Republican Party, which appears to be the same, they seem to have decided not only that it's not necessary to put in as much money, um, and secondly, <laughs> that it's necessary to reduce government expenditure, but that they will have to discipline the working class too. There have to be cuts, cuts and more cuts. So the, the, the policy, as we've seen, the Conservative Party has been put as before over here, um, has probably been the most reactionary since 79, um, 80, I suppose. Possibly even even earlier, because at least uh, there was an opposition in uh, Thatcher's cabinet. But it does seem as if they, they, they want to go back to it. The consequence of which, of course, uh, right, is that whereas the, the um, Labour Party appeared to move well to the right of the Conservative Party, it, it's now, by a kind of historical accident, not looking as bad <coughs> as, as it was, which is a fantastic feat, I think. Uh, the, anyway, the central point is that we, we now have a real difference existing between the political parties and that the uh, Labour Party will certainly cut, but it won't cut to the same degree. It won't attempt to discipline the working class, which does appear to be the policy of the uh, Conservative Party. Well, the question then is, given that these are the policies which now exist, that's to say that the uh, Labour Party will cut the public sector and raise taxes, but to a, a limited degree, whereas the uh, Conservative Party wants to really go for it. God knows how they'll do it, but they, they intend to really go for it. Uh, how do we understand the, uh, where the bourgeoisie stands on this? I find it very hard to believe the bourgeoisie actually wants to go for a policy being put forward by the Conservative Party, because it's so stupid. I mean, from the point of view of the, of the bourgeoisie, its result can only be a further decline in such industry as there is in Britain. Um, and inevitably, because <clears throat> there the people will have their backs to the wall, a rise in militancy, whatever form it begins to take. But it, 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 it probably will go quite far. It's therefore quite, it, it is a stupid policy, as stupid as the Iraq war. So well, one wonders why they're putting it forward. And I say the Republicans are doing exactly the same thing in the United States. You wonder why they're putting it forward in the first place. In my yeah. view, the, it, it's not an expression of the central core bourgeoisie. It's an expression of fringe as Thatcher was herself, and an expression of small to medium sized business, because they would gain from that. From their point of view, it does make sense. And we are, we are not, as we've already discussed, the people have discussed, we're not in a highly irrational capitalism today. It's, it's an, it can be an irrational capitalism, and the bourgeoisie doesn't always assert itself. The bourgeoisie didn't like Thatcher, didn't like what she did, but they accepted it, the central and I think the same applies today. <clears throat> uh, 
I won't want to move on from that. So let's, if you look at what the processes are which are going on, one of the major processes going on is the wiping out of the intermediate layers. If ever Bernstein looked wrong, he looked wrong today. Herbert Bernstein talks of the growing middle class. The middle class has been wiped out. It's been wiped out before this downturn through two forces. Firstly, through proletarianization, that's to say the changing of the conditions of work, so they have to work from nine to five in the usual manner as in the factory, which has obviously happened to teachers, increasingly happening to academics, and where the government's acting to doctors, to doctors, doctors, lawyers, and so forth. That, that overall and general process is quite obviously going on um, throughout the world, though in different ways and different forms and different speeds. But it certainly happened within Britain. The second process with which has gone on has been, the exception of doctors here, I've done extremely well, uh, <clears throat> there's been um, a relative decline in the salaries of what was at the end of the class. So we've, we've witnessed an overall proletarianization of so-called middle class. In fact, it's, wipe, it's potential wiping out, with certain exceptions, of course. There has been, it, <clears throat> that's the traditional work of the middle class. There, there has been, to a degree, a, um, a growth of a, what we call it, a sub-bourgeoisie of an and of sex with which we of, of managers. But that's, it's, it's much smaller. It's, it has tended to replace this, um, um, what was called in the past, the professional layers very long. But that is much more limited. <clears throat> Nonetheless, it has played an important role up, up to now. But the point is that it is up to now. The, the whole process which is now going on is obviously intensifying the proletarianization of the so-called uh, so middle class. But these managers <coughs> and so forth are now being attacked with this downturn with the firms being banked up ceasing to exist, with uh, <coughs> firms which continue <coughs> uh, downsizing their consultancy budgets and so forth. So you're getting a series of um, managers <coughs> middle managers, even senior managers, who are either losing their jobs or becoming increasingly insecure. So again, well, what, what we're actually witnessing is, as it were, <coughs> the uh, growth of the objective conditions for discontent and overthrow of society without the subjective basis. This is very obviously going on, in fact, in great very speed. Um, Boris was, of course, isn't here, but he, he was making a point to us yesterday. I don't know if you remember this, Mike, but he, he was uh, making a point to us yesterday precisely that this group of managers was announced in Russia uh, are now getting wiped out. He, his view was they do absolutely nothing. They're completely useless. They just give advice to a group which gives advice to another group which gives advice to another group, and so on. There's obviously no use at all for them, so. Now that the economy's gone down catastrophically, they're getting wiped out. So I say, <coughs> it does look as if the um, position of, of the, this intermediate layer, which the bourgeoisie consciously built up, it's not, it's not as if it simply came to existence, it did, but the bourgeoisie consciously tried to build up a middle class. And if you look at uh, often what the uh, important members of the bourgeoisie say about, say, the third world, we'll see they, they'll be talking about the importance of building a middle class. That aspect of the building a middle class was particularly um, spoken of in relation to um, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and of South Africa, it has to be said. They, they had a conscious plan of building up this middle class. Well, in the case of South Africa, to a degree, it worked. Uh, and then that they did absorb or introduce a junior PCC. It's certainly there, though it's, it's very limited. But they, they have managed to build up two or three million people who are going through education, 
to who will constitute something of a little box. On, on the other hand, of course, the overall decline of sight as a whole is breaking that. The, the intention always has been that um, as the colonial powers moved out of the colonies, they would be replaced by the so-called middle class. What's happening the world over is this middle class is getting wiped out. Now, this was happening before the downturn. It's obviously going to is being speeded up today. And finally, um, I'd just like to refer to the third world since uh, the question was raised of, of the third world yesterday. And I, I haven't really talked about it. Well, in the first instance, of course, uh, many of the countries of the third world experienced an enormous boom which nobody anticipated in the period before 2007, precisely because of the very rapid and very high rise of the price of raw materials. In fact, that rise was part of the reason for the uh, downturn. I mentioned the question of the rise in prices of assets. I didn't mean to mention the rise in price of commodities as a whole. But the reason why the rise of commodities or raw materials occurred was precisely <coughs> The same, this huge surplus of capital which had nowhere to go and then turned into speculation. There was no basis to raise the price of oil to $147 in spite of the Greens. Greens just talk uh, nonsense on this question. The oil companies have consistently said that they could, they could afford and they expect the price of oil to be around $40. In fact, that was quite high. The world expert, expert on Peter Dell, he is an emeritus professor in Holland, just couldn't understand why the prices were going up in supply terms. There actually is enough oil. It may not be enough oil. It may not be enough oil in the next number of years, but at the moment there is enough oil. In spite of all the attempts to project it, it it's uh, projected as if, it, as if there is there is enough for the time being, at least in, in the next 10 or 20 years. You remember, as the price reached $147, the newspapers were full of the fact that there was an enormous shortage of oil. The world was almost going to go under. And Goldman Sachs, which had invested enormous sums on the uh, price reaching $200, were absolutely convinced there was an enormous shortage of oil. Well, as you know, they almost went bankrupt. As a result, not as a result. It was Lehman Brothers. It was Lehman Brothers that invested a huge amount into the oil uh, sector, and they projected that $200 uh, Yeah, Goldman Sachs did actually lead that. Yeah, it's true that the uh, okay, but you now if you look at the the lead uh, the lead company in that was Goldman Sachs. And they did make considerable loss, but they they, they, were, they were bigger. Than, they were about that, if you remember. And, well, the point here is that the third world countries selling oil, selling metals, selling raw materials of various kinds, received an inflow of uh, money of capital on a kind they hadn't seen for probably a century. If you look at the inflow of capital, leave, uh, <coughs> leave aside the rise in prices, you'll see it went up phenomenally to the third world in that period. Uh, I, I had been looking in the previous period at the amount of money going into Russia and South Africa and the amount before that period going in was trivial. After which it went up at least, to the third world as a whole, it went up at least 10 times. It, it, I was trying to find out why no money, no money was going into South Africa really, other than just into stock exchange, and why, why it was the case, the same is true of Russia. And the answer was, well, very little money was going into the third world anyway. And that just changed completely. Well, since then, of course, so once the downturn came, 
they were hit by both forces. Money then flowed out, of course it didn't go in, but money then flowed out further out of Russia very rapidly, with the devaluation of the currency. They tried to stabilize it to 200 billion, failed and then gave up. Uh, in, uh, in other countries, if they had to, they had to devalue. Um, at the same time, the price of their commodities went right down. So obviously, throughout the third world, insofar as they were dependent on selling of raw materials, and which generally they are, and uh, they were uh, receiving capital from abroad, they, they have been in dire trouble. But of course, this has been a general, uh, a, a slower process, which followed the downturn rather than uh, the other way around. So that the effect on the third world was not, it was not immediate in the same way. That's to say, it didn't begin in August 2007, or the beginning of 2007, in fact, the downturn really began. <clears throat> but. There doesn't seem to be any solution then for the third world in this because it's highly unlikely that prices will, will go up, except insofar as there could be another speculative boom. But will there be another speculative boom? That does seem rather unlikely. It's true that at the moment, the price of oil has risen to $70, has now gone back, it went back yesterday. But uh, um, the price of oil reached $70, and no one disputes the fact that it's due to speculation. Nobody disputes it. Nobody thinks about anything to do with the supply of oil. If you read the newspapers, every newspaper says exactly that. Now, it was always obvious that the reason why the price of oil went up was speculation. But as I say, Goldman Sachs in particular denied it and talked about the shortages, and of course the Greens then got onto the news and so forth. <coughs> But it was speculation. And of course, you can have speculation again to a, to a degree, given the fact that there still remains this uh, huge pile of money which has to find somewhere to go. Given there is this huge pile of money <coughs> with nowhere to go, as it were, that itself is a cause of stagnation, but it's also a cause of instability and speculation, which, which will continue. In other words, from the point of view of looking at uh, third world countries in a natural form, which we can't uh, for more than a few minutes, the problem for third world countries can only continue, and it can only continue in a very unstable way. Um, actually, Yasmin has brought it out in the case of, uh, of, of Iran. In, insofar as um, the uh, the national government or the national bourgeoisie has been depending therefore on a high price of oil. They are in tremendous trouble, and the logic really of it is, as just um, brought out, is really the, uh, um, the possibility of very high levels of inflation, which has obviously happened in Russia, and it's happened in in Iran, and it, and that great inflation in 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 South Africa has gone up, as as we know. So that be the overall tendency. And of course, it, <clears throat> given the lack of money coming in, the, the decline in price of the uh, commodity, which usually there's one particular commodity in, in these countries, which is sold, it, it can only mean that the government will not have enough to finance itself. And, and the result is both in inflation and rising levels, levels of unemployment, of course. Given that, Half the levels of unemployment in the third world are catastrophic anyway. Um, in South Africa, 40% is certain. Uh, I, I would reckon it's more. The government talks of 23 to 24%. I don't know where they get that figure to be 3 to 24% really, because they've been talking of 40% for quite a long time now. Uh, obviously, yeah, it's a fantastically high figure, but there's quite a lot of countries in fact are substantially higher. I'm not talking Zimbabwe, which obviously will have very high levels of unemployment. It had very high levels of unemployment 20, 30, 50 years ago, too. But uh, it's, it has now, uh, the question is not levels of unemployment, but the levels of employment. It's at least 20 percent employment or something. Uh, not talking about them, just talking about the third world as a whole. 
um, what kind of class problem can exist under those circumstances? Again, that is extremely difficult to um, work out. And anybody living in these countries finds themselves uh, in a very difficult position because on the one hand, if you're living in a country with a large-scale peasantry, the working class very often is at a higher standard of living. You then have the, the playing off of the working class against the peasantry, vice versa. On the other hand, if you're in a country with a high level, a high level of industrialization or, or some level of in, industrialization, you have these very high levels of unemployment. The question is how you're then able to cope in organizing workers, organizing the unemployed, and so forth. It's obviously extremely difficult, particularly as you know, the most that you can do, if you if you are able to overthrow the, the government, is take power for a time, because you know you can't do very much under, under those circumstances. In the end, the solution must lie in Europe. It can't lie in any, any of these other countries. And any socialist must know that. So it becomes extremely difficult as to how you actually operate. Well, um, I've exceeded the time I, I gave myself, <laughs> which I didn't expect, I must say. Um, just to conclude, I didn't mean to be um, as uh, downbeat as, as it has come, but, and I'm sure <clears throat> that over time, the working class movement will arise and, be, and begin to uh, flex its muscles. But in the end, the reason for the absence of left-wing movement is just a question of organization. The objective conditions clearly favor the formation of left-wing movement. I'm sure it will take place. But part of the reason has to be that the left has a theory, an understandable theory, and a real theory. And it is able to link that with the overthrow of Stalinism itself and proclaim that uh, Stalinism is not the only route that Stalinism is one of the major reasons why we aren't here. Unless you're able to do that, I really don't think anything at all will happen, to be, to be honest in that. And I'm sure that that will, that will happen and is happening. So I'm sure that over time, perhaps it'll take two or three years, I don't see why it's taking longer, we will begin to see the beginnings, to say, the green shoots, the real green shoots, <laughs> of a working class movement. Thank you.